Welcome everybody to the online event, Commercial Dispute Resolution Through Arbitration, the role of arbitration services for the business environment and how to ensure its functionality and efficiency. My name is Christina Schmidtmann. I'm a technical advisor with the ICR facility and a GRZ staff member, and I will be your moderator today and looking forward to this webinar with you. Let me share some housekeeping rules for today's meeting. So please mute your microphones while you're not talking. Note that this session is recorded. And of course, you're invited to participate actively. We're looking forward to your questions, which we welcome you to put into the chat box. And if you wish so, it would be great if you add your name and your organization to your question so that we know whom the question is coming from. Also, there will be a French translation of this recording and it will be available soon on our website. Now, before we dive into today's topic, let us share a video with you on the ICR facility so that you know exactly what the ICR facility is about and what we offer to you, the organizations joining us today here. It takes about four minutes. So for all of the, you, those you, who have already seen this video, this is the time for you to grab a cup of coffee and be back in time in four minutes for the starting of this webinar. Dear colleagues, please start the video. Thank you very much, Sok. And with that, let us take a look at today's agenda. We will start with some welcome words from Esipion Oliveira, Oliveira Gomez, the Assistant Secretary General of the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States. And then we will have three, three speakers who will start by giving an introduction to commercial arbitration. We will then hear uh, arbitration experiences from a private sector's perspective and then we will hear about the role of arbitration centers for the facilitation of arbitration services. After that, we will have time for your questions, which again, you're welcome to post in the chat before we close off today's session. Now, um, before I hand over to Isipion, we have one question to you, which we would like to answer you via a poll. We would like to know how familiar you, the audience, the participants are with the topic of commercial arbitration. To be very frank, I had never heard of this topic until the beginning of this year when the ICR facility received a request from the National Center of Arbitration, Conciliation and Mediation in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So please, tell us now, what is your level of experience and familiarity with this topic by ticking one of the four answers. Take a second to reflect and you have already answered. So great, thank you so much. We have a large majority of people who say that they are a little bit familiar, they have some idea and there's also people who have who are not at all familiar and some of you who are familiar. I think this is a great basis for today's webinar. For those who are new, we really want to provide an understanding of the topic and of this instrument and mechanism. And for those who are experts, please come in with your experiences and pose some really relevant questions around this topic to our experts. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to hand over to Isipion. Thank you very much, Christina. It's an honor to be here today discussing this theme. And uh, maybe before I, I talk specifically about um, the seminar today, I would like to thank really our partners, the European Union, GIZ, British Council, the German Cooperation Ministry, BEMSET, and British France and CNV for the good work that you're doing in promoting investment climate reform in the OECPS states. For those that do not know us, the OECPS is the Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific States, founded in 1975 through the Georgetown Agreement. And nowadays we group 79 states from these regions, I myself being from the Caribbean, uh, and we're led by His Excellency, Mr. George Revelo Pinto Chicuti, who's our Secretary General. The objective of the OECPS is really to promote sustainable development of our people, and in my specific case, through private sector development. So the idea is really to empower our people, uh, to bring development, and hopefully to reduce and eventually eradicate poverty 
in this quest for development, we get, we privilege and give quite an importance to youth and women-led enterprises, uh, given that we consider that is the future. Uh, so I just wanted to put into context the ICR. The ICR is part of a OECPS European Union private sector development strategy that is based on four pillars. And that we believe with these four pillars, we can enhance the competitiveness of our companies. The first one is improving the business climate. And there you see exactly the type of work that ICR is doing. The second pillar, which also ICR is helping, is strengthening intermediary organizations in our countries. In this specific case, I see, like Christina mentioned, the Arbitration Institute of DRC. We also work supporting directly SMEs with a special attention to the informal sector. And we work a lot in access to finance uh, with several uh, members like the European Investment Bank, also the European uh, uh, Development Finance Institutions from the countries that, that also work with us, and for example, the United Nations Capital Development Fund and others. So we have a series of financial facilities that are available and that we we have grouped in a in a in a website that is linked to ICR and that uh, we hope that. Uh, the companies listening here today can see the type of offers that we have for them. I wanted to say that all of our work is based really in dialogue between public and private sector and exchange of best practices. ICR is doing a great job uh, through this type of seminars, bringing uh, knowledge from one region to another. That is very important. And, uh, and I think this is the type of way to go. We cannot intervene in every single country. ICR couldn't help 79 countries all uh, one by one, but this type of information exchange will allow us to share practices. So this is what we're looking for. With regard to commercial arbitration and dispute settlement, I, this is something very fun to me. In fact, I used to do that. I, I helped the establishment of, of the Caribbean uh, organization of dispute arbitration and dispute settlement uh, based in Guadalupe. Uh, and we established, in fact, through the work of an EDF funded program, we created the first agreement between Haiti and Dominican Republic in arbitration. Uh, both uh, the chambers of commerce of both countries came together and it ended up in a signature of a dispute uh, arbitration agreement uh, hosted by the ambassador of the European Union in Haiti at the time. And it was uh, great to see that we were looking, uh, we were working towards that. We believe that arbitration and conciliation schemes give confidence to investors. I, I would say that in my own country, the Dominican Republic just won an, arbit uh, an arbitration dispute with a Spanish company, uh, and that was quite interesting. Uh, it was led by the Ministry of uh, Trade of the Dominican Republic, in which, uh, which had received training from European Union and at that time Caribbean export. So we were very proud to see that that was going on. And the best example in arbitration, at least that I know in the OECPS, is from West Africa, is OHADA. And they have really worked in the arbitration law. So I, I think that this is a theme that is very dear to all of us. It is important that we are able to defend our interests in the international thing, scene. That will happen through exchange of best practices, through knowledges, and also through believing in ourselves. So uh, I'm, this is a, 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 a seminar that I'm really looking forward to listening. I, I will turn on my camera later, and I'll, I'll spare you of the shine of my head because I think it, it, uh, it, it will damage your eyes. But anyway, I'm really proud to be here today. Greetings from our Secretary General. And we really look forward that through ICR and with the help of the European Union, GIZ, British Council, Expertise France, SMB, and BMZ, we can make the world a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Isipion. And great to hear that you have really your own practical experiences with the topic and so, so good ones. Thank you. We will now then turn to our different speakers, starting with Jimmy Kodo. If you can turn to the next slide, please. Yes, thank you. I will not pronounce your first name, Jimmy. Jimmy Kodo is an independent arbitrator and a leading arbitration specialist with over 15 years of experience. He's been appointed arbitrator by African states in an investment disputes and regularly represents parties in complex litigation and arbitration proceedings, as well as appeals before the Common Court of Justice and Arbitration, the CCJA in Abidjan, 
the Court of Final Appeal for the 17 African States to the OHADA Treaty. He's a member of the Africa Commission of the ICC Arbitration Court, and as a consultant for the ICR facility, he drafted the revised arbitration rules of the SENACOM in the Democratic Republic of Congo and trained 80 Congolese arbitrators. Jimmy, before I hand over to you, again, the note to the audience, please share your questions in the chat. And now, Jimmy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everyone. And I'm very happy to be here with you this afternoon to talk to you about this very important and relevant topic. Before I start, I want to thank all the organizers, the European Union, the GIZ, ICR facility, British Council, and um, the ACPS and also all of you for taking the time to attend this event. I will have to tell you very briefly what arbitration is about and probably from what I learned in the poll that just uh, happened before, I know that most of you already have an idea of what arbitration is about. So basically, if I need to describe arbitration or to define arbitration, it is a way of resolving disputes, usually commercial disputes, out of court and as such it is part of what is called out of court settlement or alternative dispute resolution mechanism and arbitration is one of the most uh, well known uh, of uh, IADR alternative dispute resolution and usually when you talk about arbitration there are a set of rules that apply in most of the countries around the world and most of the institution that has to do with arbitration some of these rules are very well known one of them is the ancestral uh, model law, which was enacted in 1985 and then revised. And also they have specific set of arbitration rules adopted in 1976 and then amended two times already, 2010 and 2013. And then more importantly, I would say, you have the New York Convention that has to do with how to enforce an arbitral award after the process has been on, and then you have um, an enforceable arbitral award. New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Award. And then you have, depending on the country and the type of law that parties have chosen, you have many other rules that apply specifically. Now, I would like to move to the next um, slide, please. Okay, there is a question basically, and this question is linked to the origin of arbitration. The two topics are intertwined. Why do we go or why do people choose to leave the court system and then to go to some private system for resolving their disputes. And usually arbitration developed within the business practices some time ago, I would say a few centuries ago. And the main reason are because of confidentiality. For instance, in some areas, people do not want anybody to know about the dispute that they may have. Imagine, for instance, you are a corporation and you are considering merging with another corporation or maybe some kind of um, you want to take uh, some hold or buy some shares in another corporation at that specific moment you do not want anybody to hear that you are involved in a serious dispute with someone else because when it happens that may jeopardize the, the operation that you are considering with your partner or soon to be partner that could be one reason why uh, the commercial in the commercial business issues people do not want to go um, before the court because usually when you go before the court, in most cases, in many jurisdictions, it is something that is public. Another reason is that when you go into arbitration, usually if everybody plays well by the rules, it can be very fast. It can be swift and faster than when you go before the court because when you go before the court, you may have first level before the court. After that, one party may appeal but then after that, one party may file another appeal before the final court, which is usually a Supreme Court or Court of Cassation, depending on the countries. Another key reason why people go for arbitration is that originally, those who go to leave the court system and then go into arbitration, they want a dispute, their dispute, to be resolved by someone who knows the type of activity that they have. For instance, if you work in the industry of, let's say, construction, you want your dispute to be resolved by someone who is from that area uh, of practice and who knows exactly the type of dispute that arise and how this, the, the what the stakes are and how this type of dispute can be resolved. 
So usually, when you go before the judge, the judge knows the rules. The judge have a very broad knowledge of the rules, but he does not always have specific knowledge of the specific area of practice. And that is another reason why until now, many people, they go for arbitration and because they want to have these specific skills that this person who is from the same practice has, and then they trust the person to be able to give a better decision on that kind of dispute. Over the years, the system has evolved and now arbitration is something quite complex. And in most countries around the world, you have a different, very well-developed set of rules. And sometimes, even after you finish and you have an arbitral award, you may still have to go before the court to get enforcement of your award. Could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Now, from basic foundation of arbitration is that before you can go to arbitrate a dispute, you need to have an agreement with any other party that may be involved or anybody, any business that you have a potential um, dispute with, you need to have an agreement that when we, if it happened that we have any dispute, we do not want to go before the court system, we want to go before an arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators. So that is usually what is called an arbitration agreement, which usually is signed when people are signing a contract. When people enter into a contract, they sign this type of agreement, which is what they call a dispute resolution clause. And that clause will provide for arbitration whenever there is a dispute. Sometimes the dispute arises, and then after that, instead of going before the court, the party will say, okay, why not go before arbitration? Why not go to arbitrate this to get this dispute resolved via arbitration? And this sometimes also is something that people consider after there is a dispute. Now, there are usually three main steps of a dispute resolution via arbitration. Once you have a, a, sound, a, a sound foundation, which is an agreement to go into arbitration, when there is a dispute, people, they go, they appoint the arbitrators. In most cases, each party will appoint one arbitrator. And then the two first arbitrators for each party, usually when there are two parties, they will get together and decide to appoint someone who is the third one of the panel. When there is a panel of three arbitrators, who would be the chairman or the preside, preside over the panel of arbitrators. Sometimes you have some cases where there is only one arbitrator who is appointed. And in that case, the party could jointly appoint them. Or if they do not agree on who to appoint, then they refer to a center or in some jurisdiction, they will refer to a judge to do the appointment for them. So the main step usually is after the, for, the panel is formed, then you have what usually is called a case management meeting or conference. It's the meeting where the parties and the council and the arbitrator, they all gather together. And then they finalize the terms and re terms of reference of what will be the proceeding, the type of law that would apply, what will be done within what time frame, et cetera, et cetera. And once this meeting is finished, at the end of this meeting, everybody signs these terms of reference, which becomes the guidelines of the proceeding, the framework, the legal framework of the proceedings. After that, then each party, they will exchange some briefs, some writings and some uh, exhibits, evidence. And at some point, at a set time, they will usually organize a hearing at which the party will appear or the counsel for the party will appear before the tribunal. And then there will be some kind of oral arguments to discuss the case, to discuss the evidence, to challenge each other's party evidence. Sometimes you will have what is called a witness. Each party may decide to appoint some witnesses and present them. And then there will be some interview and cross-examination, examination and cross-examination of the witnesses. And then after that hearing phase, there will be a next step where there is during which the tribunal now will go and finalize the study of the case and all the material that has been produced and discussed before the tribunal. And then they will finally issue a decision. And at the end of which, depending on the center, you may have a one last hearing at which the award will be written, uh, will be read, or sometimes it will be directly notified to the parties by a center or the person who has been appointed to do this. So this is roughly how an arbitration procedure goes. Now, let's uh, go to the next uh, uh, slide, please. 
Could we go to next next slide? I think this is the last slide. Okay. So the current system alternative dispute resolution, we will have the trend, which is that many areas around the world, whether in Africa, whether in uh, the Caribbean countries or any other countries, it has become a trend and more and more people are being encouraged to resort to arbitration for resolving the dispute, specifically business disputes. So we have many arbitration centers. And now that we are talking specifically about African and Caribbean countries, for instance, in Africa, on the continent, you have more than 70 different arbitration centers. Some countries in Africa have more than one arbitration center. And then, as I was mentioned during the introduction, you have um, some regional institutions that organize arbitration. And one of these organizations is uh, Organization for the Harmonization of Business Law in Africa, which is known as uh, uh, OHADA, its acronym, which is uh, signed, organized by a treaty, which was signed in 1993, revised in 2000 and 2008. And currently you have 17 countries from Africa that are part of this treaty. They have two sets of rules that organize arbitration. There is one which is based on a statute that is called Uniform Act on Arbitration. This one can allow people to go organize either ad hoc arbitration or institutional arbitration by resorting to one of the centers of any of those 17 countries. Or there is a specific arbitration, uh, institutional arbitration mechanism, which is uh, organized via the Common Court of Justice and Arbitration itself, which is in Abidjan. Basically, that court, which acts as a final court of cassation or Supreme Court in the, all the areas that are covered by the business law of OHADA, that center has an arbitration center, which is an institutional arbitration center with specific arbitration rules. And if people they want, they can go and get the dispute resolved via this arbitration. One other thing that you can also notice is that if you leave Africa and then you go to the Caribbean, you could see that there are some other organizations and there are also some other regional organizations such as OADAC, which is basically like OADA, but the C stands for Caribbean countries. And they also have some set of arbitration rules. They have uh, an arbitration institution. And many countries and regions that are part of OADAC, they also have their own arbitration centers as well. So this also shows that there is a very good trend toward arbitration in many of, many of these countries around the world. And um, it is more than ever uh, important to know that you have options. If you do not want to go before the court, you can go to this. One last thing I would say uh, about this topic is that apart from commercial arbitration, you have what is usually considered to be investment arbitration. Usually commercial arbitration has to do with two different businesses or persons that uh, do business or any other activities. And then investment has to do with usually a corporation or some investor who is investing in a state. And whenever they have a dispute that is linked to do that has a link with uh, that investment, then if they go to arbitrate, to arbitrate the dispute, it becomes a, an investment arbitration proceeding, which has specific rules that apply. And usually what is the equivalent of the arbitration agreement I mentioned earlier for investment arbitration, usually it is based on what is called a treaty, usually between different states, for instance, a bilateral agreement treaty that will be signed between the treaty, uh, the country, where the investment is being made and the country from which the investor is usually. And that has its own peculiarities, but we are not going to into the details here because this is not the main topic, but it is good to know that we also know, have arbit investment arbitration, but this today we are talking more about commercial arbitration. And I think there okay. is one last slide about uh, some, yes. Jimmy, we are at the end of your time. Okay. So and very I think yes. maybe one very short sentence. I even think that this point will be picked up by Chantal and Victor as well. So maybe just one sentence and then I will cut you off. Okay. One sentence very, very quickly is that uh, it is important to know how arbitration works. It needs to be encouraged and everybody, whatever your position, 
council arbitrator or arbitration center or in-house council, it is good to get appropriate training so that everybody knows what needs to be improved and it to be to the benefit of everybody. And I'm very happy to discuss your question later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jimmy. And we already have the first question coming in. Very short question. You mentioned UNCITRAL. Can you say us for what this abbreviation stands for? Okay. UNCITRAL is a United Nations um, Convention on International Law Trade. So basically it has to do with trade. That's good. United okay. Nations Convention on International Trade. And the RAL is for? And ADR. International Trade. And then we have UNCITRAL. So the TR. Trade law. Trade law. Great. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Um, and then we will move on to our next speaker, Victor, for your information, your camera is on and also your, um, your microphone, so maybe you can turn that off. Let me now welcome Chantal Losembe to the stage. She's also a lawyer and she joined Vodacom DRC in 2003, where she's heading the Legal Affairs Division. She's worked extensively in the field of telecommunications and mobile financial services regulations. Vodacom is a company in, in the sector, and more recently in telecommunications infrastructure agreements as well. Her business practice has led her to resort to mediation, local arbitration in the DRC, and international arbitration for conflict resolution. She's also very much involved in contributing to the legal and regulatory framework on telecommunications and digital financial services in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Chantal, unfortunately, we cannot see your cannot see you now because your computer doesn't allow for you to share your camera, but we're really happy to have you here today. Please, what, how have you and your company experienced arbitration? Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to have invited me to this forum. I would just share the Congolese experience of one of the biggest company in DRC. Vodacom is a telecom company. We are operating since 2002, and we have launched our financial services in 2011. We have over 60 million subscribers, one six, and of which four million are using financial services. Our environment of business is not only composed of our commercial partners, but we have also, uh, we face various type of disputes uh, that not ultimately end up as a lawsuit that goes from IP dispute on our ringback tones to rental disputes of billboards, site acquisition, fraud in financial service. So you see that most of our disputes have nothing to do with our core business. As a multinational company, we usually praise arbitration as against the best uh, dispute resolution method. For a business perspective, the uh, obvious advantage of arbitration are for us, the control of the whole process. So as we are controlling the process, we are appointing the arbitrators, the limited possibility of appeal that Jimmy mentioned as, uh, already, and the fact that there's no public hearing so that it preserves a bit our confidentiality. I will not point, I will not cite all the points that I raised, Eric. I think you can read them. In the years 2002 and 2003, when we are at the inception of the, the, the company, the Vodacom legal management at that time introduced ad hoc arbitration clauses systematically in all contracts they had rentals, everything, there was ad hoc arbitration clauses. But we ended up to have a management of litigation impossible to manage. We spent incalculable time in selecting arbitrators. We battled to pay administrative fees on time. The cost of arbitration and arbitration arbitrators' fees sometimes were exceeding the value of the dispute itself. We ended up with a backlog of unprocessed litigation that we could not handle at the point where we had to petition before court to clear all this backlog. We decided then to change our uh, approach of the litigation uh, resolution and we split our litigation portfolio. We took all small value disputes 
and all disputes that uh, where arbitration was not allowed, such as labor, penal, and uh, all arbitra uh, cases where third parties, uh, we had no con contract with them, we just direct that to ordinary courts. And we reserved the uh, arbitration for complex, high value, and material dispute. We split it among the, the, the cases that were directed to arbitration. For local arbitration, we reserved medium value dispute. We uh, worked well with the Senacom and uh, we had a good uh, uh, understanding of uh, the, the problem with uh, Senacom. And we were very, very happy to, with the predictability of uh, the outcomes that we get. The only thing that we uh, was uh, uh, we were deploring with the Sinacom is the independence of the arbitrators, because most of the arbitrators that were there uh, were former business lawyers whom we had already used as lawyer in the past. So we had uh, we had some uh, constraints in terms of our independence to deal with, with them. For the international arbitration, we, as I said, we reserve complex cases. Also, the cases where uh, our opponent is very influential in a DRC, so that we could uh, make sure that they are not making pressure on court and. Uh, litigation where uh, dispute where there's little or no connection with the DRC. We referred very often to the Paris Chamber of Commerce, which is, uh, I think, our, our main institution that we are referring to. We also started a little bit with the CCGA uh, arbitration, but we were not yet convinced of uh, the maturity of this um, institution and transparency in the um, uh, publication of list of the arbitrators, which is not uh, very uh, easy to find. So based on that, we had some lesson from our experience uh, of the arbitration, the commercial arbitration against the arbitration other matters. We believe that business must learn how to live also with local jurisdiction and uh, not turn a blind eye on them despite the attraction for arbitration. Local jurisdiction remain uh, of value when it's about small uh, disputes and uh, they are still uh, very rapid in the um, treatment of uh, some matters. To achieve that, we, we must put in place a risk management, a robust risk management with controls and set level of tolerance of what we can provision because it's not sure that you will earn your case, but at least you have provision for what you could lose. We Then we leave small disputes where arbitration is not allowed to local jurisdiction and we reserve arbitration for material disputes. So I'm ending there with the three recommendations I would make to uh, investors. I would suggest that you do not implement a no jurisdiction policy, rather segregate your disputes, reserve arbitration for material case that will add value to your business. And the other one, just put your risk management in place. I would not recommend to use ad hoc uh, arbitration because it was a nightmare for us. I do believe that institutional arbitration has proven its efficiency and uh, their arbitration rules are very easy to use and uh, we can use uh, the one that are uh, usually uh, in their uh, 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 internet uh, site very easily. And the third point, which could be maybe the first for me, it's to implement a very strong procurement policy that requires you to check with whom you are partnering. Because if you look uh, in the historical of the different disputes you have, if you had choose better 
the your partner you wouldn't have chosen the one that is bringing you litigation so i'm ending here uh, christina if you have question i'm at your disposal thank you so much chantal we will come with the questions later after the third input this was really great to have this practical perspective from your side and if i get you right your statement is arbitration is a very good mechanism but it's not a one-size-fits-all we don't use that for every case that we have but we carefully decide for which cases we put arbitration clauses and we go for arbitration and in other cases we also go to the public court systems in the drc or we go to the international level thank you so very much chantal we will then turn to our third speaker who is again a lawyer but again with a very different perspective victor mugabe is the secretary general of the kigali international arbitration center since january this year so again uh, congratulations to that and prior to that he served as executive director of the rwanda bar association victor is a lawyer with rich and long experience in legal and and justice related project management victor over to you Thank you, Christina. Thank you very much for actually considering KIAC in this event that is very uh, useful for the participants and the network under ICR. Uh, so um, I'm going to take a very few minutes to allow participants to ask questions just to provide experience with the institutional arbitration under KIAC rules. Uh, so as I say, uh, the Kigali International Arbitration Center actually is located here in Kigali, in Kigali, Rwanda, that uh, and it was initiated by the, the business community of Rwanda sometimes in 2005. So uh, the center was established in 2010 when uh, uh, the, uh, the government of Rwanda ratified the UN, the UN Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of uh, Foreign Arbitral Awards, known as the New York Convention. So the ratification was uh, done in 2007. So this ratification process was followed by the um, adoption of the law governing arbitration 2008 and uh, after in 2012 then KIAC was um, uh, started its activities and enacted its rules that were inspired by the the uh, UNSTRO rules and UNSTRO model law on international commercial arbitration so it means our rules our laws are benchmarked to the international based standards of the international arbitration mainly the two uh, uh, the, the, the two instruments. So the core business of KIAC is actually to facilitate and uh, provide the dispute resolution services, especially arbitration and other alternative dispute resolution, like conciliation and mediation. We do also promote uh, ADR through public education, awareness, publication, and research. Uh, we also do provide training and accreditation in ADR for the practitioners. But also, uh, uh, we do promote Rwanda as a venue for the international arbitration, as we advise also the government and other institutions and organizations in arbitration matters. Next slide, please. So, key achievements since the past uh, uh, nine years of the KIAC existence, uh, we do now count more than 150 international arbitrators from 42 or 24 nationalities. We've resolved um, slightly 180 complex and high value disputes uh, of arbitration. So out of those cases, 40% uh, are, are international or uh, dispute with parties from more than 20 nationalities. So we do conduct proceedings in English, French, or our local language known as Kenya Rwanda. Uh, and we have realized that uh, the service and construction sectors account uh, more than 80% of the key case load. But, so the remaining 18% is uh, shared among the shareholding, sales, transports, procurement, uh, etc. Next slide, please. So now uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Jimmy Koto and uh, uh, our sister from Congo, uh, Chantal, we, she has mentioned actually why she opted for using uh, 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 institutional arbitration instead of ad hoc arbitration, so from her experience. But here, let me share with you the role of arbitration centers in arbitration proceedings. 
So first of all, what the centers do is to conduct awareness reason on arbitration services, building the capacity for the arbitration practitioners, the case ad administration, uh, including the administrative and the other logistic support, uh, ensuring the applicability of arbitration rules. Uh, so here, KIAC, uh, like ICC in Paris, we do scrutinize the awards. Uh, we do also ensure the security and safety of confidential documents. We do provide facilities for arbitration proceedings, the hearing rooms, internet, video conferencing facilities. So the centers also have to uh, the role of disseminating information on arbitration. So advocating for conducive legal and institutional framework for arbitration, as well as engaging in a relationship with other strategic institutions. Next, next, please. Yes, but the institution also meet some challenges because the arbitration institution in Africa are really institutions that are working under a number of, uh, of challenges. First of all, the first uh, challenge that we meet is inadequate funding. So the lack of trust in African arbitration institutions, so the lack of, 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 of trust is actually uh, expressed by our fellow Africans and even uh, other international uh, business people. So there is a lack of data in different arbitration institutions. So lack of institutional capacity to meet the demands in international commercial arbitration matters. Fear of courts or government interference in arbitration proceedings, as well as the inadequate legal and institutional framework on international commercial arbitration. The, the challenge has too many, but I tried to select quite uh, six or seven challenges. Okay, let's continue. Next, next slide. slide. One minute, Victor. Yes. So the success setup of uh, and management of arbitration centers. So if you want to have a very successful uh, arbitration center, you have to ensure that you have a conducive legal framework on international arbitration, conducive policy on investment and business promotion, put in place strong capacity building program, modern arbitration rules and affordable fees, collaboration with the bar association and uh, the judiciary as well, lobbying for uh, centers funding, safeguarding the quality of awards, marketing the center, collaboration with arbitration institutions, as well as have, avoiding any discrimination in enrolling the panel of neutrals. So I think those are very few uh, tips that I can share with my colleagues. Uh, maybe this is the end of my presentation. I welcome the question that you may have and uh, thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Victor, and thank you for this recipe for how to build such a successful arbitration center as the KIAG in Rwanda. And again, you're still welcome to put some questions in the chat, but we have already received um, quite a number of them. I would like to start with a question to Jimmy. Uh, very straightforward. Um, are arbitration rulings legally binding? Can one of the parties um, take the case to the court after the arbitration mechanism if they are not happy with the result? Thank you. Yes, arbitration awards, arbitral awards, they are binding on the parties that sign the agreement, usually the party that are involved in arbitration proceedings. There are specific cases where a party who has not specifically signed a contract can still be bound, but this is very complex and you know it doesn't happen often. So arbitral award, they are binding on whoever signed and get uh, entered into the agreement to arbitrate a dispute. On some cases, it can be possible if you have an arbitral award and any party is not happy of it, basically, usually there is one party who loses and the other party who wins, and usually the party who loses is not happy. Now, in most jurisdictions, there is a possibility to challenge the award. So you go before the court. It is not an appeal per se, like it happens when you have a court judgment, but you can go on some limited grounds. You go before the court and you challenge the award. Basically, you say that, for instance, uh, in the radar systems, you have mainly six reasons for which you can challenge an award and be successful, hopefully. If there is no valid arbitration agreement, if the tribunal has not uh, followed strictly the rules, basically they have failed to uh, meet the standard of its mandate, or failed to its mission, then that is another ground. If public policy has been breached, that is another ground. And then if uh, you did not, uh, there was no, how do you call this, um, due process. If there is no due process, let's say for instance, 
there is one party, you allow a party to show their arguments, but you did not show the argument of that party or all the document evidence of that party to the other party, then they will say in law that there is not a due process. So for some of these reasons, for, for example, you can challenge your word before the judge, the court of law, and if the court is convinced has proper evidence that what you are saying is true, then your word can be unmuled and then it will becomes, you know, it cannot be used, it cannot be used anymore. So those are the cases where you can do it. Yeah. Great. Very precise and clear answer. Uh, let's move to Chantal. Chantal, you have mentioned a few deficiencies in the in the way arbitration is conducted in, in the DRC. Um, our listener is asking, what are your suggestions? How can the practice of arbitration in the DRC be improved? What are your proposals? Yes, um, the most of the deficiencies that are mentioned are around the uh, profile of the arbitrators. As I said, most of them were um, business lawyers that were uh, we already used as lawyers. So it's difficult for us to bring them as arbitrators. But what we've seen is that we saw a lot of uh, um, uh, an, an uh, progress from Sinacom. Uh, They have awarded a lot of arbitrators with different profile, and we are happy to see that. And uh, we also think that uh, they should also invest more in their uh, in facilities to uh, give more, uh, um, I would say, ease for for us because we are a big company and sometimes in region we do not have uh, arbitration. We must uh, pull everybody in Kinshasa, which is uh, difficult for us. So I think most of the um, uh, reluctance of uh, local arbitration have been mentioned by uh, our colleague uh, who, who passed before me, uh, uh, Victor. And uh, there's also a problem of trust, and the trust, uh, it's uh, the profile of the arbitrators that will, will, will uh, I would say, build the trust. Thank you. So it's about capacity building and then also diversity in the profiles, specialist profiles and independence. And that brings me a bit to the third question to Victor, because all of this requires resources to do to invest in arbitrators. Um, Victor, the question is how are such arbitration mechanisms and centers such as yours usually funded? What are your sources of funding? Uh, the main source of funding for these arbitration institutions like uh, in Rwanda, uh, as I said in my uh, like the first slide of presentation, is like this is, was the initiative, the idea, the baby of the private sector. So the business community uh, that are gathered under the private sector federation. So it means that umbrella, uh, uh, because it is there to promote the business here in Rwanda, so it 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 uh, like provides some funding to the uh, the work of the Kigali International Arbitration Institution. So it means the center itself is funded by the business community here in Rwanda. But also, as we do uh, uh, contribute to the doing business indicators of the country. So we do work with the Department of the of the of, of Rwanda in charge of doing business here to give us some funding for just the capacity building, and uh, to some extent I can say that uh, also the government provides some support uh, uh, to the work of the uh, arbitration center. We also do provide we develop some uh, proposals that. Uh, we submit to partners, uh, like uh, especially the partners that are active in the economic sector of the country and the justice sector, because we do consider arbitration as a, a tool for access to justice, but also a tool for achieving development goals. So those partners that intervene in these areas, we do work with them and they do provide some funding uh, for a very limited period of time, that's for to support the capacity building initiative. But also we do, uh, uh, get uh, some uh, uh, funds from the activities that we do conduct researches, for example, on ADR. So we do conduct some consultants work on research 
we do uh, collect money for training. So we get some uh, uh, the training from the participants, the seminars, international conferences and symposia. So as a, a destination for tourism on this continent of Rwanda. So also arbitration is also seen as uh, one of the um, you know, uh, economic activities that people may come and uh, uh, we do organized international conferences where people pay, then we get some, you know, it's a really a diversification of source of funding because you cannot get any single source of funding for arbitration centers. But we have to work with, uh, with uh, the private sector, uh, the business community, and not leaving out the government, though government is part of the proceeding here, but also we do contribute to the national development of the country. And that's why we, do, we, we work with the economic departments. Uh, of the of the of the government to get some uh, uh, funding so maybe those are key sources of funding for the arbitration center we have Thank a large you. portfolio of funding sources and that helps a lot uh, I think. Not... maybe a, 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 a last question if an individual if a company comes to you and asks for for arbitration services do they have to pay for the services and what's about the amount of such a service Oh, okay. Maybe uh, let me add on that. It's a very, very important and good question. Uh, you know, one of the success of the arbitration institution on the African continent is to set up lower arbitration fees. We should not compare our institution like KIAC to ICC, to, to LCIA in London, to AAA in the United States, but you have to set to, to benchmark your arbitration fees to the uh, like the, 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 the financial capabilities of your potential clients. So the reason why we have managed to, to register like 1,800 cases is that uh, we do have a, affordable arbitration fees from the filing admin fees and arbitrators fees. And as my colleague Chantal said, uh, you know, for example, here ad hoc arbitration are far expensive, far more expensive than institutional arbitration. But here, we know that our arbitrators complain that we pay them <laughs> a really very low pay because what we want is not to gain from arbitration service but is to promote so we do work with some good volunteers international experts from all the continents because of the passion that they have to promote arbitration but not what what they are going to get from the fees that the national or other so that's why we get those international cases that are filed under kiak rules because our fees are lower thank you very interesting. Thank you so much. I have one last question. I would like to pose it to all the three of you and to give me an answer just in one sentence. The question is, we have seen or the participant has heard that there's a lack of trust in the arbitration system in many countries. What is your specific recommendations for increasing trust? Chantal, let's start with you. Your final statement, how to increase trust in the arbitration system. I think it's a very long process and um, uh, it's um, a vir virtuous circle. So the more the uh, center will will have good awards, the more people we have trust and this is a long process. So we must create a virtuous a circle around this uh, uh, institution and people will, will come more and more and more and more and this is a process. This is my point of view. Thank you, Jimmy. I would say to the parties, choose your counsel very well. Choose your, your lawyer who represents you, choose them very well. To the lawyers, choose your arbitrator very well. And then for everyone, I would say specifically for the center, make sure that you train all your lawyers, all the, 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 your arbitrators, and that you communicate for instance, if it is uh, possible to have a website for most centers showing the profile, usually it is good because when you see the name of someone, you can go and do some research, ask some people around, do you know so and so, what is his or her reputation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That would contribute over the time uh, to a better transparency and helping uh, limit the, these issues of trust. Thank you, Victor. Yeah, maybe to supplement what my colleague said, I would like to that uh, you, we like arbitration sense should uh, uh, influence the the enactment of conducive legal framework on international arbitration by leaving 
courts and the political system from the interference into the uh, arbitration proceedings. Because for the arbitration to succeed, we have to have the judiciary out of the system, the political you know, system out of the system. So that will bring actually the more trust to the arbitration proceedings. And the, the institutional arbitration have to play a very big role in ensuring that you have a very conducive legal framework. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to all of you, Chantal, Jimmy, Victor, Esipion, for those really insightful inputs. I have learned a lot and I hope that our audience has also learned. Both the experts that we have on board, maybe you have gained some new insights and those to whom this topic was new. Um, maybe you have also had an idea during this call on how you can support arbitration in your country, in your region, maybe with the support of the ICR facility. Um, and with that, we will come to the closing. Um, Sok, if you can switch the slide once more. Exactly. So just to highlight once again the offer of the ICR facility. If you are a public or a private stakeholder, uh, a chamber of commerce, an association, an arbitration center, a ministry, an agency in um, one of the ACP countries and you want to improve your business environment through arbitration or other um, on other topics through other initiatives, reach out to us. You have our website here below. You can find a request form which you can fill out and uh, we will get back to you. We can support you with technical assistance of up to 90 expert days. And now, thank you all very much. We would be happy if you could fill in our satisfaction survey, which comes up now exactly. With that, I would like to wish you a very good day or evening, depending on where you are. And we look forward to meeting you again in our online webinar series. Thank you so much and see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.